I'm going to, I'll start off by reading and then oh, you've cool. got, do you have tough questions? Do you want to do the tough questions? They're really difficult. Yeah. Why don't you read first? I'll read and first and then, and then I'll let you okay. grill me. Okay. So this is kind of a hybrid of a book. It's um, part uh, graphic novel and part novel. And it begins with a graphic sequence, which I am going to describe to you. Um, in the Tickham kitchen late on a summer afternoon, we see Mrs. Tickham, Mr. Tickham, and a gigantic vacuum cleaner uh, with a bow on it. And Mr. Tickham is very excited to present this gift to Mrs. Tickham. Uh, he sings happy birthday to her, and he uh, tells her that he has purchased the vacuum cleaner, basically, of her dreams. It is a Ulysses 2000X, the crown jewel of vacuums. It features an extra long cord so that absolutely no mess, no dirt is ever out of your reach. It's indoor, outdoor. It goes everywhere. It does everything to which Mrs. Tickham responds, goody. And he's like, no, really, you have to try this out. So he plugs it in. She turns it on, and in very short order, this vacuum cleaner consumes her, her poetry book, a complete box of buttered up crackers, and also Mr. Tickham's pants. And then he, thrilled with how powerful the vacuum cleaner is, suggests that she should try it outside. And the vacuum cleaner then pulls her outside, and that's how it all began with a vacuum cleaner, really. And here then is chapter one. Flora Bell Buckman was in her room at her desk. She was very busy. She was doing two things at once. She was ignoring her mother, and she was also reading a comic book entitled The Illuminated Adventures of the Amazing in Condesto. Flora, her mother shouted, what are you doing up there? I'm reading, Flora shouted back. Remember the contract, her mother shouted. Do not forget the contract. At the beginning of summer, in a moment of weakness, Flora had made the mistake of signing a contract that said that she would, quote, work to turn her face away from the idiotic hijinks of comics and toward the bright light of true literature, end quote. Those were the exact words of the contract. They were her mother's words. Flora's mother was a writer. She was divorced, and she wrote romance novels. Talk about idiotic hijinks. Flora hated romance novels. In fact, she hated romance. I hate romance, said Flora out loud to herself. She liked the way the words sounded. She imagined them floating above her in a comic strip bubble. It was a comforting thing to have words hanging over her head especially negative words about romance. Flora's mother had often accused Flora of being a natural-born cynic. Flora suspected that this was true. She was a natural-born cynic who lived in defiance of contracts. Yep, thought Flora, that's me. She bent her head and went back to reading about the amazing Incandesto. She was interrupted a few minutes later by a very loud noise. It sounded as if a jet plane had landed in the Tickham's backyard. What the heck, said Flora. She got up from her desk and looked out the window and saw Mrs. Tickham running around the backyard with a shiny, oversized vacuum cleaner. It looked like she was vacuuming the yard. That can't be, thought Flora. Who vacuums their yard? Actually, it didn't look like Mrs. Tickham knew what she was doing. It was more like the vacuum cleaner was in charge, and the vacuum cleaner seemed to be out of its mind or its engine or something. A few bolts shy of a load, said Flora out loud. And then she saw that Mrs. Tickham and the vacuum cleaner were headed directly for a squirrel. Hey now, said Flora. She banged on the window. Watch out, she shouted. You're going to vacuum up that squirrel. She said the words and then she had a strange moment of seeing them hanging there over her head. You're going to vacuum up that squirrel. There's just no predicting what kind of sentences you might say, thought Flora. 
For instance, who would ever think you would shout, you're going to vacuum up that squirrel? It didn't make any difference, though, what word she said. The floor was too far away. The vacuum cleaner was too loud, and also clearly it was bent on destruction. This malfeasance must be stopped, said Flora in a deep and super heroic voice. This malfeasance must be stopped was what the unassuming janitor Alfred T. Slipper always said before he was transformed into the amazing incandesto and became a towering, crime-fighting pillar of light. Unfortunately, Alfred T. Slipper wasn't present. Where was incandesto when you needed him? Not that Flora really believed in superheroes, but still. She stood at the window and watched as the squirrel was vacuumed up. Poof. Fwomp. Holy bagumba, said Flora. Okay, I'm ready for those tough questions now, Lindsay. Well, I guess the first one is... um, well, your books are just so wildly original. Um, I mean, where, can you talk about where you got the idea for this one? Were you shopping for vacuum cleaners? Was I shopping? It's a long, it's a long answer. And actually, it's funny because by the time a book is done, you sometimes forget where it came from. And so, um, I started digging through all of my notebooks, trying to piece together how I arrived at this strange juncture with a squirrel and a vacuum cleaner. And um, a couple of things happened around the same time. One of them was that a squirrel was uh, dying on my front steps. And uh, he looked uh, very distressed, and I didn't know what to do for him. And uh, I called one of my best friends who lives a block and a half away and who's actually the sweetest and kindest of all of my friends. So what uh, the conversation that we had shocked me because I said, there's a squirrel dying on my front steps. What should I do? And she said, do you have a shovel? And I'm like, well, yeah, I've got a shovel. And she said, get the shovel, get a T-shirt. I'll come over there and whack him over the head for you. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And at this point, because I'm outside on the cell phone, I'm thinking that the squirrel has probably heard what she's saying. So I go inside to get away from the squirrel hearing these bloody words. And I keep on looking out the window, and shortly after that conversation with her, the squirrel went someplace else to die. Um, And so, but I had this idea of a squirrel and a squirrel suffering, and that I wanted to save a squirrel's life. So that was number one. And then number two was that uh, my mother had passed away earlier in the year, and she had a vacuum cleaner that she loved, uh, an Electrolux vacuum cleaner. And um, she was always worried about what would happen to the vacuum cleaner after she was gone, and I promised her that I would take it. So the vacuum cleaner was in my garage, and every time I pulled into the garage, I would see the vacuum cleaner, which would make me think of my mother, which would make me sad. And so to honor a vacuum cleaner, to honor my mother, and to save a squirrel, here we are. There you go. And it seems like the book, it, it covers some, you know, some dark topics like divorce and loss, and then it seems like the inspiration also was, you know, a bit sad in a way, but it's such an uplifting, you know, laugh out loud book. Can you? I, I, it is a strange mix of funny and tragic, isn't it? And and I myself am a strange mix of funny and tragic. And I was at that juncture of those two, uh, you know, that I wanted to laugh. It had been a really um, um, long, hard year. And so I think it came from wanting to make myself laugh. And also my mother was somebody who uh, loved to laugh. And both of us laughed in exactly the same way. She, we look like, uh, as a friend of mine says, baby birds waiting to be fed. We throw our heads back. And so I was thinking of my mom and making her laugh too. So, but there are all those other dark things in there. All the, all the things that seem to preoccupy me as a writer with abandonment, loss, despair. But there's a lot of joy too. Yeah, and, and what's it like writing about those, those things for a younger audience? What do you keep in mind? Uh, what do I keep in mind 
writing for a young, I always, the, the, the foremost thing in my head is the story and how to tell the story well and accurately. And as far as writing for kids, the only rule, the only hard and fast rule that I keep in my head is uh, something from uh, Catherine Patterson, which is that you're duty bound when you write for kids to end with hope. So other than that rule, all bets are off. And so, um, but I know that I'm always working towards a hopeful ending. But I don't actually, you know, because there's been a lot of um, talk in this book about uh, multi-syllabic words that I use, some of them which I cannot pronounce. <laughs> I just know them from reading. Um, but, I, and I've actually had people list off like, you know, 20 words of, uh, and so I don't think about vocabulary, I just think about telling the story well and true. Mm -hmm. And um, your characters, especially Flora and Ulysses, they, they have so much life. Can you talk about your inspiration for those characters? Um, I don't know, you know, it's with characters, I, you know, people always say, how do you develop a character, character, how do you make up a good character? I don't even feel like I make them up, it's more like I kind of discover them, so I never have to work on the character development, I just, it's always that thing of where there's something very true about them that I'm trying to get to, and, um, it's, it's funny because kids always want to know, are you in the book, which character is you, and... I never thought this, but when the book went out um, in you know the early pages, I gave it to uh, close friends to read, and there was just this thing about how much I was like Flora Bell Buckman, and I'm like, really? Wow! It never occurred to me, and all my friends is like, well, this you know here you are on the page, and and I was saying that to my editor, and she's like, wow, that's really interesting. I always kind of thought you were the squirrel, so. <laughs> Yeah. And it seems like um, in writing from Flora's perspective, you also, you're, you're seeing the world through a different lens. You're seeing grown-ups and adults in situations in a very pure, in a childlike way, I guess. Um, how have you found that writing for children, writing for this audience, has affected your worldview and how you see the people oh, around you? Oh, that's an interesting, difficult kind of therapy couch <laughs> kind of question. So writing for kids, let me paraphrase you and see if I'm understanding what you're asking. How has it changed how I look at the world? It's really interesting because I remember when the first book that I uh, wrote because of when Dixie came out and, and I got asked so many times now, how do you think your way into the, the mind of a 10-year-old? And I'm like, well, I, I was a 10-year-old, so I don't have to. And so I think that that child... That child me is always present, and and I think that is in part of the reason that I love writing for kids is because uh, that person, the wonder-filled kind of like looking at the world, uh, like are you kidding me? This is the world kind of thing. That's me, and so it, it is my sensibility, and and it's only been deepened by writing for kids. And uh, yeah, what were you like as a child? Were you, you I was like, strange. Like Flora, with your natural born cynic? I was, you know, I, was I a natural born cynic? I was probably too terrified to qualify as a cynic, but um, I was, and, and I think as an adult, I am uh, what a friend calls a perky curmudgeon. <laughs> so I was probably like that as a kid as well. I was a kid who loved to read. Um, who uh, was very wary of uh, a lot of uh, situations, but um, I was also a kid who uh, loved to laugh. And like, you know, Flora, you know, there's that saying, scratch a cynic and find a romantic underneath. I think that that's Flora and that's me too. And um, there's one portion of the book um, when, Ulysses, when we're first reading Ulysses' poetry. And it reminded me a lot of um, Charlotte's Web. Oh, that's a nice thing to say. <laughs> and I was, um, I was wondering kind of what, what are your inspirations and what, were, what did you read as a kid that really has stuck with you? Um, so Charlotte's Web certainly was, uh, it, it, it's a wonderful connection to make because Charlotte saves Wilbur's life with words. And... Uh, in a strange kind of way, Ulysses saves Flora's emotional life with with words. Um, 
I never read Charlotte's Web when I was a kid. Um, I was, like I said, a huge reader, but I remember going to the library every week and there was a spin rack of uh, Newbery and Newbery Honor books and paperback, and I always remember looking at the face of Wilbur and thinking that something terrible was going to happen to that pig, and I just didn't want to get involved, you know? <laughs> Um, and little did I know that it was the spider that I should be worried about. So I didn't, I did not read Charlotte's Web until I was uh, in my early 30s when a writing teacher said, if you really want to be writing for kids, you can't not read this book. And I have read it many, many times since then. And it always, for me, is that, that is kind of the thing that I'm striving for, what E.B. White does in that book. So it's a wonderful compliment that you've paid me. He's, he has this amazing ability to like make w one word do the work of 10 words. And I'm always trying to figure out how he did that. And then the other thing that's so apparent with him is how much he loved the world. And that shows up in, in, on, on every page of the story. So. Cool. It's great to know where your inspiration is. Well, I, yes, E.B. White probably doesn't want to be um, sorted with me, but, you know, there we are. I'm trying. I'm trying to get to what he did. Cool. And, um, and a lot of your books, you have animal characters. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about your relationship with animals? Yes, animals, it's like it almost becomes kind of um, ludicrous when I lift, list them all off. So it, it's a dog a mouse, a tiger, a pig, a rabbit, a fish, a monkey, an elephant. Uh, I think, you know, see, I don't have any dignity. And, and I, don't, I don't intend to put animals in each story. They just kind of show up. And I think that's because I, I love animals for quite a while. I thought that I wanted to be a veterinarian. And then I found out that I didn't have the stomach or the brain for it, but or the heart, because I think it would have broken my heart. But um, I've also found as a writer that uh, we as readers tend to open our hearts a little bit more to animal characters sometimes before we open them to the human ones. So it's a, 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 it's a quick way into a heart. Do you have a favorite animal that you've written about or want to write about? Um, I get all kinds of letters from kids telling me what kind of animals I should use. And some animals, I, I have to say, I, I have to go to the Internet to look up to find <laughs> out what they are. Um, I, my favorite animal is a dog, you know, and that's where I started. I love, love dogs. Um, although we did, you know, try to save any number of baby squirrels' lives, and we always failed, I have to say, when we were kids. So, um, so this book is so great. It has these kind of big themes. It's funny. Um, and it also incorporates um, a comic style. Right, which was, so this, it is interspersed with part of the story is told in graphic format. And that was not the way I wrote it. It was, uh, I turned it in as straight text. I never thought of doing it as a kind of a, a graphic novel hybrid kind of thing. That was the design director at Candlewick, Chris Paul, who said, what if, because the squirrel becomes a superhero of sorts, and so what if every time the squirrel is doing something super heroic, it becomes a comic strip? And I'm like, well, that's a fabulous idea. I loved it, and I didn't have to do it. I, I, what I had to do was kill some of the darlings of, you know, what, of what I'd written and give them over to uh, illustration, but that was a small price to pay for what Keith Campbell did here, which is just gorgeous. And... Um I think you've told me you, you never met him during the no, process. No, it's, it's funny because um, people, I think, when, when they are looking at a, an illustrated book, think that the writer and the illustrator are in a room together working things out, and that could not be further from the truth. So um, generally what happens is I uh, will see sketches. I will give my opinion of the sketches to my editor, who will then take it to the design person. The design person will talk to the illustrator. We are kept very far apart. And um, I've always had this theory that it's because writers are neurotics and um, so are artists, let's face it, and that it would not benefit anybody if we were speaking to each other because we would out neuroses each other, you know, and nothing would get done. And that's basically true. That's what I found out, that they, try, they keep you apart for that very reason. So, well, and I finally, <laughs> I met him when everything was done, and he's lovely. He's a lovely human being. 
Was there a certain um, strip or illustration that you saw and just couldn't swooned. believe it had been? Swooned. Yeah. I, well, <laughs> I can't believe what he did with all of it. And the funny thing is that we were, um, he lives in California and I was, did a couple events with him when I was out there and then I got to go to his house for dinner, which was great, but um, because I'm a squirrel and I love to eat, but, um, <laughs> and he's a really good cook. But he, there are wonderful things that he did that for anybody who studies these illustrations that he uh, took a wonderful, wonderful poetic leaps with some of the details that he put in there. And I won't tell you what they are because it's fun to look for them I hadn't noticed them. He pointed them out to me, and, and they're wonderful, wonderful things. But what appeals to me above and beyond everything else is there's uh, the squirrel at the typewriter speaks to my very heart, you know? So I just, I love that. And everyone's thinking, holy bagumba. Right, <laughs> right, holy bagumba, holy bagumba, which, you know, I don't know where that came from. And there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of controversy with us trying to figure out if I had like, you know, used a word that we didn't know was a word. And, but I think it's just totally out of the blue, holy begumba. I don't know, anybody know what that means? Right, okay, good, we're good. Um, and yeah, so, so you're known kind of for using, taking leaps with writing and um, using phrases like holy begumba kind of, can you talk about like, where do you come up with these things? They're yes, what's wrong with me? Where no. do I, where I, and you know, it's funny because I think that I'm actually a very timid and frightened person in my day-to-day -day life, but where I am willing uh, to take chances is on the page. And so that's like, so um, strange things will pop into my head and I'm willing and happy to follow those strange things. And um, I've learned to carry a notebook with me for that very reason, because I never know when something strange and lovely will appear in my fevered brain. Cool. And um, now that Flora and Ulysses is out, kind of what's the most surprising feedback or something that a fan has told you? Well, it's interesting to me that with a book that is, um, I think, funny, and it remained funny, funny for me even after rewriting it like seven or eight thousand times um, that uh, what I've consistently heard is that people have laughed but that everybody has cried at the end so did you cry at the end I did but wow. I'm a crier <laughs> wow wow so that's been wonderful to hear and um, and it's also wonderful to to read it out loud to people and to hear them laugh. And the very first thing that I did on the uh, day that the book was published, um, I uh, read out loud to uh, an audience in, in St. Paul at the Fitzgerald Theater. And as I was reading, because they were laughing so much, um, I started to get that kind of feeling like, uh-oh, I'm going to lose it and not be able to go on because it was, and that was spectacular and wonderful. And I did get a hold of myself and not laugh at my own jokes, as a friend of mine would say, so. There's nothing wrong with laughing at your own jokes. Well, her thing about me laughing at my own jokes is that she says I'm laughing so loudly at my own joke, I can't tell if other people are laughing or not, so. <laughs> See, well, you were laughing, I listened, I tried not to laugh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I guess a lot of authors, they, they think about a certain person, or they feel like they're writing for someone. Do you have, do you feel like you're writing for yourself, like you're writing for a certain person? I feel like I'm writing for the story and, and like I have to be, this is always the way I feel, is that the story is smarter than I am and my job is to follow the story. And if I were writing for any particular person, I think probably the person that I'm writing for is the 10 year old me you know, in the story that I needed to hear, so. Cool, and t just to take a step back um, away from this most recent book, do you wanna kind of talk about um, your writing process and how, how your books usually come together? My writing process. Um, so when I decided that I wanted to write, I made a deal with myself that I was gonna do two pages a day because I figured that was a doable goal and so that's how I started. And, um, and I, I would get up and write before I went to work in the morning. And happily, 
uh, I was working in a book warehouse at this point, and we had one of those old-fashioned time clocks where you would clock in every morning, and there was this guy that I worked with at the book warehouse named Gary, who was always waiting for me at the time clock to ask me two questions, and one of them was, uh, do you think that Dickens wrote just two pages a day, which always just drove me mad. And then when I ha spluttered and had no answer for that, then he would say his second question, which was, what's plan B, babe? What's plan B for when the writing doesn't work out? And so I, was, I would just go up to the third floor of the warehouse, which was where I was assigned, on just like I was enraged. And it was great, because I stayed enraged all through the day, and it got me out of bed at 4.30 the next morning to write again. So... I have proceeded, I'm not as enraged as I used to be, um, but I've proceeded by doing two pages a day, and, and two pages a day is a, a novel a year if you actually show up every day and do two pages every day. I do it first thing in the morning. Um, I have the coffee maker set. I come downstairs, I pour the cup of coffee. I write, preferably while it's still dark. Um, I find it's a very helpful time because as you're half awake, and um, you're still kind of connected to the dream world. And also, I've found that uh, the voice that says, um, who do you think you are? You can't do this. You're not a writer. You don't know what you're doing. That voice tends to sleep in a little bit. So by 9 o'clock, when that voice starts really kicking in, I'm already done with the writing. So Great. And um, what advice would you give to people who are trying to make it and just starting out writing? Uh, advice, I would say um, you should read as much as you can. And if you want to be a writer and you're not thrilled to get the assignment to read as much as you can, then maybe you shouldn't be a writer. So read as much as you can. Make some kind of deal with yourself about how to do the work. Because for me, I got it into my head uh, when I was 20 that I was going to be a writer. And I spent um, 10 years talking about it, reading interviews with writers, and uh, not writing, um, which didn't really work that well. Um, so make a deal with yourself to do the work. And then the last thing I would say is that you got to keep everything kind of open, your ears and your eyes and your heart, um, and just always be looking for stories. Cool. Well, I think we're going to um, open up the floor to a Q&A session. When did you start writing? When did I start writing? I started when I was 30, but as I was saying, the, the, there were 10 years that preceded that where I, uh, what had happened was I, I had a professor in college who said, this is a direct quote, you have a certain facility with words, you should consider graduate school. And I thought he was really trying to tell me that I was wildly talented. And I thought, why bother with graduate school? So I just got, um, some black turtlenecks, because that's what writers wear, right? And I wore them, and I sat around looking kind of bored and disdainful, and everybody would go, oh, that's Kate, she writes. Um, so I spent 10 years doing that, um, and then when I turned 30, I came up with, okay, I'm gonna, I could see very clearly that I could spend 20 more years doing that, and that I was gonna have to find some way to do the work. So two pages, and that's when I started at 30. I'm what you call a late bloomer. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm wondering if you ever feel like you miss characters from your previous novels, and if so, how you reconnect with them. Do you go back and reread your books? It's a, a wonderful question. Um, I, I, there are a couple of characters who haunt me, and then there are characters that I miss. And... Um, from this book that I just finished, there's a, a, a character named Dr. Misham who has, it's an older lady who has a horsehair sofa. And I find myself very much wishing that I could go to her apartment and sit on her horsehair sofa and have her feed me grape jelly sandwiches. Um, and, and by the same token, Gloria Dump from my first book because of Wen Dixie, who was another older woman who uh, I would like to go and sit in her backyard. I'm haunted by um, Bryce, who is a character in The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane, and I think about him, and I think, does he need another story? So that's a different kind of feeling than the wanting to be in a character's presence, kind of. It's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, um, I'm an actor, but I also write screenplays. And I was just wondering for you, where does the idea start? Uh, do you do a lot of planning beforehand, and you look at a plot outlined, and then you decide, all right, I'm going to do this plot line in order, or do you just sit down and then go at it and then decide to edit it like a little later? Uh, yeah. It's, a, it, it's so fascinating to me to talk about process. I know a lot of people who write, and nobody does it the same way and for me and it's I, I was uh i was in a school a couple days ago where a kid asked a question like that and i said for me i cannot outline something in advance it's just it i it, as soon as i know where i'm going i'm not interested in going there anymore so i i write kind of by the seat of my pants and i like follow the story but i don't know what's going to happen and this kid was great because he he raised his hand again and he said but what if someone's forcing you to and i'm like who's forcing you to well it was his teacher and she was showing them how to like plot out a story and i had to turn to her and say i don't want to get in the middle of this argument but if i was in your classroom i wouldn't be able to do it that way so i can only I can only go forward with a lot of uncertainty towards something that I can barely see. What about you? Do, oh, you don't have the. Oh, you do have the mic. Good. Oh yeah, I I tend to plan a lot of things out. You do. Uh, but I, I find it's not working for me lately. I, I tend to get too in my head with things and then delete this outline for this plot and then write another outline for a plot, start writing that, and then start all over again and do another whole entire idea. And as soon as you say outline to me, I just totally check out. It's like a part of me just dies because I think, well, if I'm going to outline it, then I don't want to do it. You know what I mean? So, you know, not that you're soliciting my advice, but I would say uh, leap and don't look, you know? Definitely. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I have yes. a question. Um, I have a Two questions kind of around a bunch of your books have gone to movies. So I'm curious about, A, as the author, how you see the world you created and how it's portrayed and people think they understand maybe the characters from a different perspective versus reading it. Um, and then, I mean, there's a bunch of different science fiction series that are becoming movies lately. I've always been a book over movie fan. Mm -hmm. But also, what would be your favorite book to movie series? If huh. you have any. Huh. Well, I can tell you my favorite. I can't do a favorite book to movie series, but I can do a favorite book to movie. I think one of the best ones. Well, there are a couple of really, really good ones. One, To Kill a Mockingbird, and two, Ordinary People, which if y'all haven't watched that for a while, it's just like it holds up beautifully. Um, I think it's really hard to turn books into movies because... Um, almost all of us have a movie in our head when we're reading and the movie that's in your head is not going to be the movie that's in the person's head who's making the movie so um and i have in any time you tell a story i've found it's kind of like this you let it go each step of the way so when a book becomes illustrated, what the illustrator draws is not what I saw in my head, and so you let it go. And it's the same thing with it becoming a movie. Then it's somebody else's vision. Um, that said, I've been thrilled with you know both of the movies that got made, and, and um, movies are super advertisements for books. All kinds of people find their way to the book that wouldn't normally find their way there. But I think it's really hard to make a movie that's going to satisfy everybody's vision of the book because everybody's vision is different. We all see something different when we read. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi. Did you start out when you started writing, when you were 30, did you start out wanting to write uh, books for this particular age group? Or did you try other things? And what's your feeling going forward? Um, I started where a lot of people start with short stories for adults thinking they are short, therefore they are easier, which of course is completely erroneous. But I had a, a, a happy um, kind of a serendipity doodah thing, as a friend of mine would say. Pretty soon after I started writing, I got the job at the book warehouse. I was assigned to the third floor of the book warehouse. And that third floor was nothing but children's books. So my job there was, I was a picker. I went around and picked the books off the shelves. And I entered into that job with this kind of like peculiar disdain that adult readers have for children's books. 
but it was only a certain amount of time before I could pick a book off the shelf without having some kind of curiosity about what was going on in it. So I started to read the books. And the first one that I read, uh, the first novel that I read for kids was The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963. And I loved it so much. And I thought, I want to try and do something like this. So, and I did try, and I've been trying ever since. <clears throat> and I think I've also, through really good fortune, found my where I should be as a writer. Because people will say, are you gonna ever, are you gonna write something for adults? And I feel like I'm telling stories, and adults find their way to my stories too. So I'm perfectly thrilled with where I am, and I feel like it's where I should be. Hi, who are your favorite living authors? Favorite living authors? Richard Rousseau, um, Ann Tyler, Dinner at the Homesick Restaurant, I loved. Catherine Patterson, Christopher Paul Curtis. Um, I, I'm trying to do the quick math in my head of who's alive and who's dead because they're all alive in my head because of their books, you know? So I have to kind of like, I'm sorting them this way and that way. Um, I love Michael Chabon. Um, uh, I love Alice Munro, and yay for that Nobel Prize for Alice Munro. Um, is that, should I, I can keep on going probably. Is that, is that good? Is that good? Oh, okay. I think we're done, right? Yeah. Because I'm still doing the living and dead sorting, so that's not good. Yeah. All right. How about a, uh, a warm round of applause for our favorite living author at the moment, <laughs> Kate DiCamillo. Camillo.